Hi, I'm Strycha, and I love Transformers. Over the decades, the Transformers franchise has produced many shows, movies, games, comics, and toys for fans both young and old. Although I never watched Transformers as a little kid, I fell in love with the franchise when I explored the universe as a curious teen. I was surprised by the uncanny ability that these kids' shows had of making compelling characters, well-crafted stories, and emotional arcs about alien space robots. I love you so much. But life is short, I am busy, and there were only so many shows I could watch. I'll be honest, I haven't seen all of them, or even most of them. But among my list of favorites would be the original G1, the Unicron trilogy, specifically Armada, Animated, and lastly, Transformers Prime. I even occasionally tuned into Rescue Bots. You've been hit by, you've been struck by, struck by. But today, we're going to be talking about Transformers Prime. Prime is a unique show, to say the least. Its slightly edgier and mature themes are often praised, considering it is still kept clean enough to be a kid's show. Its interesting style draws newcomers into the fandom, who previously had no interest in the franchise, by presenting a more realistic and harrowing version of the Transformers story. Equally, some consider the show overrated, preferring other shows and putting forward the opinion that they manage the same messages with more eloquent and subtle themes. Some find the fans of Prime annoying unable to see the value in other shows, and rabidly fangirling over attractive characters and surface layer morals. While these wars rage on in the fandom, I'm not here today to talk about that. I'm more interested in the core of Prime, the root of it all. With this review, I would like to dissect Transformers Prime and cast aside our nostalgia and biases to actually explore each of its aspects. Is Prime a good show? Does it have a good story? What about good characters? What about the production quality? These are the questions I would like to ask, looking at Prime for what it is and being as honest as possible. So let's take a look. First, a little background on Transformers Prime. It aired on the Hub Network from 2010 to 2013, running for three seasons and concluding with the film Transformers Prime Beast Hunters Predacons Rising. With its sleek, realistic 3D animation and gritty setting, this show stands out quite a lot compared to other shows. While dark themes are nothing new to Transformers, especially in the IDW comic series, Prime is well known for being one of the most grim dark pieces of Transformers media, without being outright crass. Its style is unmistakable and, to this day, there is no other Transformers show that mimics it. I found YouTube to be woefully lacking in long form and thorough reviews of this show, and I intend to take on the lengthy and admittedly ambitious project of remedying that. Oh, great heavens! Before we begin, I would like to quickly summarize how I'm going to be dissecting this show and sectioning this review. First, I'm going to do a quick summary of my personal overall opinion of the show. I'm going to then dive deeper into the various aspects of the show and note them accordingly, rooting out both their strengths and weaknesses as I observed them. These aspects will include plot, characters, animation and visuals, music, and voice acting. Lastly, I'm going to end with a final summary, my objective view on the quality of Prime. I am qualified to do this, my opinion is right, and anyone who argues with me is wrong. I just ate my microphone. If I've missed anything or misinterpreted something, feel free to let me know in the comments below. Let's do it. Do it. And lastly, major spoilers for Transformers Prime. You know, it's kind of hard to describe how I feel about this show. Some people drink alcohol. I, uh, drink alcohol and watch the show. It isn't perfect, by a long shot, and there's a lot of things wrong with it. 
But compared to the actual piles of crap produced in media these days, going back to this show was like the freshest breath of air I ever breathed. But yeah, this is probably one of my favorite shows ever. It's not the highest class of media in existence by a long margin, not when IDW exists, but like, it's a solid interpretation of Transformers. I have a habit of enjoying grimdark universes, and I consider Prime to be the perfect mixture of Bayformers and G1. For me, it's my comfort show. I'm gonna be straight with y'all. Prime doesn't have the most amazing plot in the world. Come again. I know, I know. Settle down. I'm trying to be honest here. In a world full of media with compelling, complex, and effective plots, Prime doesn't really compete. But it's certainly not offensive. Interestingly enough, Transformers Prime is spearheaded by a certain two Alex Kurtzman and Roberto Orsi, who were the screenwriters for the first two live-action Transformers movies, Transformers and Revenge of the Fallen. It comes as no surprise, then, that Prime actually follows the vague plot of the first live-action movie. Cybertron is a dead planet. Both the Decepticons and Autobots are scattered among the stars. Megatron is missing, and Starscream is currently leading the Decepticons. And the Autobots found themselves on Earth. The similarities end there, presumably because Prime is actually half-decent. Prime's plot follows the typical Transformers guidelines. Cybertron has fallen, and must be eventually restored slash reclaimed. The Autobots are at war with the Decepticons and need to protect humanity from them. There are a few humans who are helping the Autobots, presumably for the kids to relate with. Since Season 1 started with a five-episode miniseries, which later became Season 1, those first five episodes have their very own arc, which ends up being pretty disturbing and sets the mood for the rest of the show. To make a long story short, Megatron is off finding some weird material called Dark Energon, which revives people from the dead and makes them into zombies. Yeah, that's the beginning of the show. We get to see this works because he revives a murdered Cliff Jumper from the dead. Cliff Jumper deserved better, I know. The instinct to destroy anything in its path. I think I leaked a little transmission fluid. And then he tries to revive battlefields full of dead soldiers and later the entire planet of Cybertron to combat the Autobots. We get to learn that the entire planet is essentially covered in the bodies of the dead from the war, which is not disturbing whatsoever. But of course, our Autobot heroes and their human allies manage to defeat them, and from then on, it's that typical Autobot-Decepticon dynamic. The Decepticons find some way to attack the Autobots, usually related to finding Energon. The Autobots counter them, the battered survivors return to their bases to fight another day. Season 1 is mainly this. The finale concluding with the resurrection of Robot Satan, who is in the core of the Earth, and Team Prime trying to keep the Earth from exploding. Did you catch all that? Hang on, we got some more coming. Season 2 is when the plot really kicks off, introducing the Iacon Relics, ancient weapons and tools from Cybertron with incredible power, as well as the Omega Lock, a machine that has the ability to restore the dead Cybertron to a... not dead Cybertron? It's not really explained, and so basically the Decepticons and Autobots end up fighting over who gets to use the machine and essentially rule the reformed Cybertron. Season 3 and the movie Predacons Rising follows that basic overarching plot with smaller arcs in between. The Omega Lock gets destroyed, rebuilt, the Autobots attempt to destroy it, use it instead, but uh uh-oh, Robot Satan is back and he wants to kill Robot Jesus who is in the core of Cybertron, so then both the Autobots and Decepticons have to team up to fight the ultimate evil, so they can have their planet back. Good triumphs over evil, Optimus Prime sacrifices himself for Cybertron, all's well that ends well and we get a nice, happy ending. Overall, it's pretty basic, and the plot has enough room in it to act as a vehicle for the characters involved, rather than the other way around. It highlights certain character aspects and arcs, 
without deriving too much from the Millennium of War narrative that makes for an action-packed adventure. It makes sure there's room for drama and character growth without taking too much of the fun away. It's well-constructed, and it makes sense. The overarching tone is kept more so on the grim dark end, but makes room for comedy, and it's kept up pretty well. The Autobots don't always win, and we're frequently left on the edge of our seats, unsure as to the outcome of conflicts between the two sides. Now I'm gonna complain about it. The plot's not perfect. It's not amazing. It's not the absolute paragon of storytelling, and I'm not gonna pretend it is. Tons of things just don't make sense and are just kind of there. They're unexplained, even though it's kind of important and the story wouldn't be smooth without them. Like Raph, for example. How the hell can he understand Bumblebee? Even though he's speaking in binaric beeps? Is it even binaric? What is it, Cybertronian? Yeah, that doesn't make sense. At all. And they don't even try to make it make sense. Like, you could say that it sounds a bit like, I don't know, some weird computer code he knows. Or do some bizarre stuff where he can convert the electrical frequencies into sound, or, I don't know, make something up. Anything, literally anything, is better than, I don't know, I have magic powers. Raph is also a two-year-old nerd who can hack into government systems, so, whatever. Both are convenient and ridiculous. What about Arachnid? At some point, you really have to ask yourself, RC, is it them, or is it me? Is that a fucking woo face? How the hell can she communicate with the Insecticons? After all, the Beast and I are somewhat related. You might even say we are of one mind. How? In what way? Are you an Insecticon? Were you created by the Decepticons? Speaking of, why are you a weird spider thing? How come there aren't any other bug Transformers? Are you semi-organic, like Black Arachnia from Transformers Animated? We never get to learn. We know the Insecticons were creations of the Decepticons. Is Arachnid some weird creation of presumably Shockwave? Or maybe the Insecticons were based off of her. Hi, it's Editing Streicha here. So there is apparently an explanation, or an implied explanation, as to what species Arachnid is. Apparently it's these kind of spider Cybertronians. Uh, it's never mentioned in the show, though, so my uh, criticism still stands. It also still doesn't explain why she can control the Insecticons. And don't get me started on her plotline, which was completely dropped. Arachnid gets stranded on the moon after being broken out of stasis, and is a vampire who is cannibalizing the entire Insecticon hive. Her feud with RC isn't complete, Knockout should have some kind of bone to pick with her for murdering Breakdown, and we get this cool-as-hell final shot of her, but that's it. We don't get anything more of Arachnid. That's the end of her story. Which is actually awful storytelling. Like, if they wanted to kill Arachnid off, why didn't they just have her get crushed under the Autobot base? Did they not know they had to cut her yet? It's all just so awkward. And while Arachnid's dropped plotline is maybe the most obviously offensive thing this show has done, at least as far as I'm concerned, it has the unfortunate habit of making things very convenient for our heroes, or seriously nerfing their enemies in order to give them more Ws. How about how the Decepticons are hyped up and shown to be incredibly powerful only to deliberately dumb them down in favor of the Autobots? Like how the Vehicons were able to knock out Cliffjumper and then got him killed, but are then useless for the rest of the show and just used as fodder. Or how it's absolutely ridiculous that Soundwave didn't locate the Autobot base at any point in time in the first season, at least via the children. Like, it doesn't matter if the base has some kind of jammer in it or something, because Bumblebee, Bulkhead, and RC are constantly carting the children from Jasper to the base. And Soundwave knows exactly what these kids look like, and if he's capable of snooping in on RC and Cliffjumper's conversation at the beginning of the show, he is absolutely capable of intercepting chatter between the Autobots and kids, or at least tracking the kids out to the desert. Hell, he knows they're hanging around Jasper, and that they look a certain way. He should be able to just find the Autobots and watch them, or at least use Laserbeak to do so. They should have been demolished, 
by the end of the first season. Your conclusion is most logical. Thing is, it feels like they wrote the Decepticons as super threatening in the first five episodes, and then they realized they were too scary and that the Autobots would not logically survive. But a lot of convenient things happen in this show. Convenient abilities, convenient occurrences, convenient coincidences. Awfully convenient that Earth is where Alpha Trion decided to put a bunch of super important relics, on top of just so happening to be the planet encasing Robot Satan on top of being the planet that happens to have a lot of Energon, that both the Decepticons and Autobots decided to fight over. Well, okay, to be fair, Alpha Trion could see the future. I could go on and on about the things that are a little too convenient in Prime. The show does a lot of things to help the Autobots and shoehorn things in, and sadly, I can't say that that's good storytelling in the long run. It's not horrible, and it doesn't distract from the show too much, but it's way too common to be ignored. The whole Predacons spiel is... awkward. Like, I love Shockwave, and I'm happy he showed up, but the Predacons are so unimportant and unnecessary. The hunt for their bones is just a revised Iacon relic hunt, and it starts to feel like a trend after a bit. Nothing important is done with them, and they're just kind of forgotten. My final verdict, it's a good solid plot. It takes time to focus on the characters involved. It gives room for most of the characters to have their arcs, barring a couple like Arachnid, and by the time the show reaches its end, it feels satisfying, like our journey with the characters has indeed finally ended. However, it's not what it could have been. A lot of you may not know this, but this show actually had a ton of issues when it came to production. The higher-ups, producers, and writers had major conflict as to where they wanted the story to go, and the show went way over budget to the point they had to kill characters off to let go of voice actors. Hasbro essentially wanted Prime to be a reboot of the entire franchise and bit off far more than they could chew, along with making a show that simply cost too much. As a result, a lot of ideas were thrown to the wayside that could have made this show much better. The whole show was supposed to have a fourth season, the story was going to go in different and more organic directions, and the production team should have had much, much more time to make it. There's actually a really great video here on YouTube by Paperplane going into further detail as to the issues Prime had with production, which I'm going to link in the description. But long story short, Prime was not what the creators wanted it to be, and it's not what we could have had. Despite all that, it's still a good enough plot and enjoyable for what it is. In fact, when learning the Nightmare It's production was, it's shocking that it is as good as it is. And for that, we're all grateful. Prime's characters are the reason I like Prime. I'ma just say it right now. Some are more compelling than others, some have bigger arcs, some are more interesting, and some are completely thrown to the wayside. For the most part, however, I think Prime's characters and characterization is excellent. I like both the Autobots and Decepticons, as well as the human characters. And yes, I like all three of the children. That's an unpopular opinion, to say the least. Prime does an excellent job of show-don't-tell when it comes to the personalities of its cast. Each character's core traits are well fleshed out, with both positives and negatives. With almost every character in Prime, you can go down the list of both good traits and genuine flaws. Things that set them back throughout the show and make them feel like real people with real emotions. They have in-depth conversations with one another. Every line characterizes them and solidifies them as who they are. There aren't any contradictions in their actions, and everything they do are things they would do. That might sound very basic, but once again, I'd like to point you to the cesspit that most popular characters are today. Ratchet is my favorite example, to the point that he is my favorite character in Prime. Most illogical. I'm sorry, Shockwave. You're my favorite in every other piece of media. Whatever you say, sunshine. 
Ratchet is an old friend of Optimus Prime, a veteran of the war and a capable combat medic and surgeon with expertise in electronics and equipment. He is Team Prime's scientist and their backbone. They wouldn't be able to function or survive without him. And yet, he is a cynical old grouch, insecure about his usefulness in his more passive role, and troubled by his inability to fully restore his patients. He isn't the most moral of bots, and he's pretty jaded, convinced that helping humans will only bring them ruin, spiteful of the children that they are meant to protect. Yet when the Omega Lock is destroyed for Earth's sake, his devastation is heartbreaking, and we begin to sympathize with him and his mindset. Optimus destroyed the Omega Lock. What? You did- What was necessary? There was no time for another prolonged battle, not with Earth in imminent danger. So you destroyed the only device in any universe capable of restoring our home? Optimus, we needed that. You weren't there, Doc, and it's not your place to second-guess a battlefield decision. It most certainly is. There had to be another way. It, it wasn't that simple, Ratchet. Megatron was using the Omega Lock to attack the Earth. Optimus saved our planet. What about our planet? All of our struggles and energon spilled and countless sacrifices for nothing? He might be capable. He might be coarse. But deep inside is a being that has lived and lost and suffered amidst the horrors of war, whose anger and despair at the news that their home and civilization is lost forever cuts deeply. This is someone who's watched his comrades die under his hands, unable to save them. This is someone whose entire life was dedicated to this millennia-old struggle that has claimed the lives of people he once called friends. So, we owe Bumblebee's life to that field medic. That's one way of looking at it, I suppose. Though the medic could have done better. His hopelessness only spirals downwards during the course of the show especially once their base is destroyed, Optimus missing, and the end of the war imminent. But due to his relationship with Raph, his love for Earth built up over the course of the show, and his stout spark, he finally manages to step up when his comrades need him the most, to reunite the team and save both Earth and Cybertron once and for all. At the end of it all, he actually decides to remain on Earth to watch over their human friends, while the rest of Team Prime returned to rebuild Cybertron. Bidding the enlistment of rusty old Autobot consultants. Ratchet? You of all- Yep, yep, yep. I know where I am needed. Look at this Chad right here. He's not the best among them, perhaps not even the most noble. But he is heroic. Flawed, but heroic. He is only one example of powerful and interesting characters throughout the show. Every character's story is unfolded throughout the course of Prime, and they're a joy to witness. Anyways, now we're going to talk about the things I don't like about the characters in Prime. Like this fucking asshat. Whew, man, so here's the thing. Potential. So. Much. Potential. Completely wasted. So many cool character dynamics. Completely wasted. For as human and well-fleshed out as they make some of the characters feel, not all of them get equal treatment particularly some of the villains. Knockout, for example, is deplorable. He likes to torture people and tries to kill defenseless humans and bots alike on multiple occasions. They try to make some kind of redemption arc for him in the final quarter of the last season and in the movie, but it kind of falls flat and his redemption doesn't feel earned. Anything else? Thank you. You're welcome. Now don't worry, rabid fanbase. I love Knockout, and he is a very good character. He just didn't have a well-executed arc. I'm sorry. And in my view, you have each acted as a prime. Except for you, you little shit. Well, I never really had the best role models. Not only that, he doesn't even get the chance to have an emotional scene after Breakdown's death or even a reaction at all. 
He doesn't even seem to mourn him very much, aside from mentioning him a few times and torturing Silas as revenge. <laughs> my, 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 whatever have you been inflicting upon poor Silas? Ha! Well, anything that merits the need for a living Petri dish. That's how I lost my medical license. Which seems pretty in character, but they did seem pretty close. He doesn't even mention Arachnid, who was the one who literally killed Breakdown. But seriously, they don't give us nearly enough of an ending for the Decepticons as a whole. Megatron, despite being a murderous little shit the whole show, just gets to redeem himself and then yeet off into the Aether, never to be seen again, disbanding the Decepticons and completely fucking over his loyal subordinates. Seriously, go get Soundwave, he's stuck in the zone! Shockwave just disappears. He gone. This is literally his last scene and line. Would it not be more logical to employ your might elsewhere at this time? Soundwave gets zoned. Arachnid gets stranded on the moon and immediately forgotten. The show is apparently allergic to ending the Decepticon stories. Like, okay, like, why couldn't you kill some of them? It's at least implied that Starscream gets killed at the end by the Predacons, but that was completely reverted by robots in disguise. Comfortable. Well, not anymore, I'm not. In an inner chamber, I found just what I'd been hoping for. Weapons hoarded by Megatron. Fuck you. And fuck your sexy voice. And listen, I'm not saying that they should all have to die or be imprisoned or anything like that. But what did happen was incredibly unsatisfying. Would it have hurt to add a scene where Shockwave is in some lab somewhere fiddling with experiments? Or to finish the Arachnid arc? Have a single main Decepticon other than Dreadwing and Breakdown die, like Soundwave or Starscream, uh, seriously. While this show is paraded as being the dark, more mature version of Transformers, it actually plays it relatively safe when it comes to the consequences. Characters die, sure, but nobody who we're actually going to miss. Not in the grand scheme of things. Makeshift and Skyquake barely even get a debut before they're subsequently killed. Sea Spray, someone who Bulkhead and Wheeljack apparently knew, dies off camera. And aside from grieving him in that one episode, he's never mentioned again. Likewise, both Tailgate and Cliffjumper's deaths are brutal, contributing to RC's PTSD and development. But we get to see very little of Cliffjumper and even less of Tailgate. There are a few fake-out deaths, but the only actually established, long-running characters who die are Breakdown, Dreadwing, Hardshell, and Optimus Prime himself. For God's sake, not even Megatron dies! I don't think the lack of death is inherently bad, but considering how gritty this show is trying to be, it comes off as a little odd that all the members of Team Prime make it out unscathed and even better than before, in Bumblebee's case. None of the humans even get injured permanently, by some miracle, or even really traumatized. Seriously, I have a hard time believing they'd make it out of this whole ordeal without getting at least a little squished. Especially you. And speaking of character endings, I personally hate what they did with Silas. Seriously, how about that weird out-of-character decision to murder his staff after they turn him into a Cybertronian? Seriously, Silas is an old U.S. military colonel. You think he'd know a thing or two about the advantages of keeping his human colleagues around. You could make the argument that he went mad due to the procedure, but nothing he does or says or thinks leads up to that or supports it afterwards. He's a super interesting, smart, and sinister character that's treated with total disregard and disrespect. Not to mention that Mech was an interesting organization that was wasted. His death at Arachnid's hands is not even really satisfying, and it's incredibly undignified and not worthy of the character. And like, why Arachnid's hands? Not Knockout? Is it because we couldn't have Knockout kill someone or something? I don't get it. I don't know. Don't get me even started on Makeshift. Do any of y'all even remember he existed? I completely forgot, because he did one pretty cool thing and then frickin' died. 
Like, we could have had so many cool moments of the Decepticons sneaking makeshift into the team or causing all kinds of problems for Team Prime, but he just makes his debut, does a damn good job of pretending to be Wheeljack, and then kaboom. Huge waste, in my opinion. Now, I gotta talk about Miko. You know I gotta talk about Miko. Hot take, I actually like her a lot, and she reminds me of myself quite a bit. Zdraicha, you ask? Does that mean you're also an annoying little shit? Yes. Yes, it does. Miko is a hothead, and she gets in the way, and she absolutely should be fucking dead. There's no way, after all the stunts she's pulled running after the Autobots, that she or her friends should have survived. They could have done something really cool with her character, making her continue to behave like a literal retard until it got someone hurt for real, which would then permanently sober her up and make her more cautious. But consequences don't exist in Prime half the time, and her dumbass gets to continue to be a dumbass until she literally kills a guy, and then kind of feels bad about it. But it's okay, because it was a bad guy. It's actually a really great character moment for Miko, but I wish we got more. She's just kind of annoying most of the time. I still love her, though. <laughs> I understand what you're going through. If you ever want someone to talk to... I'm I fine, okay? I'm not the one Hardshell tried to scrap. Nico, it's rough when someone you care about gets hurt. Closing yourself off from feeling won't help anyone. Well, you would know, wouldn't you? Yes. I would. Man, I gotta be nicer to this show. Anyways, moving right along. I also wish that Bumblebee had a character. Like, at all. Bumblebee is ignored a lot in this show. I can understand it being hard to characterize someone who can't talk, but the movie Bumblebee literally did it. To be fair, they had the radio, but why couldn't they do that in Prime? It's so problematic to the point that even though Raph is technically Bumblebee's partner, they've got him effectively as Ratchets instead. All of Raph's emotional and tactical moments are shared with Ratchet instead of Bumblebee, and so are all of his character developments. And yeah, yeah, Bumblebee dies, revives, kills Megatron, gets his voice back, it's all very sudden, and... While emotional, doesn't hit right. Not for me, anyways. I, I was never impressed by him in this show. I feel like they did him real dirty. I feel like his death was incredible, and as much as I like Bumblebee and all, I kinda wish he stayed dead. It would have at least been unique. Like the story, some characters and their arcs simply are incomplete. Those who are fully characterized, however, are wonderful. And Prime's version of its characters are often considered the best iterations of those characters. The visuals. Ah, the visuals. The animation in this show is a pleasure to look at. It's smooth and expressive, perfect for both action scenes and dialogue moments. The newly revised Transformers designs, which are realistic yet reminiscent of the original G1 shapes, are lovely. Each one of them, aside from the Vehicons, are unique and easy to recognize, even without the color coding among the Decepticons, who are mainly colored gray or dark shades of blue and purple. Some are small, some large, some angular, some smooth, some wide, some skinny, and I'm not only a huge fan of them, but I'm also a fan of the way they move on screen. They look and feel astonishingly human. From the small gestures and shrugs to the way the eyebrows, mouths, and eyes move to express emotion. Each character moves a bit differently based on their size, shape, and personality. It's a little strange, from a world-building sense, as to why space robots would have such a human appearance, especially when it comes to their eyebrows, but from a technical standpoint, they look fantastic. On close-ups, you can see small details like the scratching in their plating, 
or the shining of their finish. No wonder Knockout likes to look at himself. I like the way I look in steel-belted radials. Me too, Knockout. Me too. The action scenes flow wonderfully, and they move like they genuinely have weight to them. I don't even really care for action myself, but I like to watch these scenes just because it's really fun to see this stuff come alive. Like, it's clear the animation team put a lot of love and effort into this show. It's kind of funny watching huge robots fly across the screen or jump really high, but since they're aliens and there's a lot of power behind their movement, there's nothing that contradicts their ability to fly all over the place. There's nothing of this style that I've seen that looks this good, especially not during 2010. For the time and technology available, this is amazing. Of course, there are some flaws. Considering the issues Prime had with production, there wasn't time to iron everything out perfectly. There are animation errors, such as the shine of the Transformers' metal being technically inaccurate, or this haunting scene where Ratchet doesn't have a face. Seriously, where did it go? Looks like Steve here got some revenge somewhere along the animation process. Get melted, wheel grinder! Melted? Now there's a concept. It was at this moment that he knew. He fucked up. No! No! The Transformers look really great, but the humans don't so much. Unfortunately, where the robots had an excuse due to being massive hunks of metal when it came to awkward movement, the humans don't really get the same. They move awkwardly and have pretty strange expressions sometimes, and it just gives a sense of stiffness and uncanny valley. Where it excelled for the Transformers, it looks kinda weird on them. I know it's stylistic, though. Another thing that could be criticized are the sets. Mainly, the show is set in either on Earth or inside the Nemesis, with very little variation. On Earth, we mainly hang around Nevada, in the middle of a barren desert land with lots of rocks and canyons and sand. Exciting. I know. I don't like sand. It gets everywhere. We do get to see a few different sets on Earth, like the forest, the Arctic, that one metro, etc. But they're pretty simple sets and relatively bland, with not much going on. The town of Jasper looks like an absolute ghost town all the time, with no people, very few cars, and very little happening at any time. I know it's a rural town and all, but as someone who lives in a rural town, you're still gonna see people walking around. The Nemesis is dim, dark, and sinister looking, but otherwise pretty unfurnished, and not that interesting. We do get to see Cybertron a couple times, and we even go to space for a bit. But for the most part, the settings are neutral and pretty bland. The textures and lighting are not particularly good, although it's certainly not bad for the time. Again, this was 2010, but I mean, the damn Dawn of War intro managed to give the dirt more texture than Prime did, and that came out six years earlier. The budget is probably to blame for the bland settings. They did their best with what they had, but it's only passable as a result. The show does look quite good in the grand scheme of things. I do love watching the characters move and interact, especially Ratchet and Starscream, who do a lot of really great expressions and gestures. <sighs> Completely logical, my liege. Let's talk about the music now. Frankly, the music of Prime is beautiful. I'm not going to waste any of our time here. I have no complaints with it whatsoever. Composed by Brian Tyler, the soundtrack is this orchestral epic music that feels perfect for the more mature tone of Prime. Whether solemn but hopeful, 
dark and sinister, sad and distant, the soundtrack for this show has it all, and I love it deeply. It sucks you into the scenes no matter what's happening, and it's just perfect. They apparently used a live orchestra as well, so we're hearing the real deal. No point in saying anything else. The voice acting. My goodness, do the voice actors act their little hearts out. I... I can't do it. I do not want to hear that kind of talk, especially from the likes of you. Do you feel defenseless, Autobot? Good. Cliffjumper, are you... I... I can't... I can't believe you actually care. I've been duped. You get it, the voice acting's good. The cast might be small, but the performances are stellar. Many of the voice actors already being acclaimed stars. Peter Cullen and Frank Welker, the voice actors for the original G1 Optimus and Megatron, respectively, return to their roles for this show, giving their characters a more serious and dramatic twist. Several celebrity voices found themselves among the cast as well, such as Adam Baldwin, Gina Torres, and even Dwayne The Rock Johnson, playing Cliffjumper in the pilot episode. Now isn't that something? Without a doubt, regardless of fame, the voices in this show are amazing. They are expressive, interesting, and perfect for the characters they're portraying, even if it is a bit of a subversion from the usual way that character is shown. A good example of this would be Steve Bloom as Starscream. A character usually given a high-pitched and screechy voice is instead given a deep and sinister one, if a bit squeaky at times. Oh, Dad! He's blown his vocal components! I guess that makes me the new leader! Everyone believes you are deceased. Who am I to disappoint them? Ah, uh, yes. The duality of man. It perfectly portrays this version of Starscream, however, and it's hard to imagine the classic voice on this face. Sumalee Montano as RC has the most buttery woman's voice I've ever heard, and I actually can't get enough of it. Hey, partner. Heck of a view you got up here. If there's even a small chance your spark is out there listening, well, we could really use you, Cliff. Seems like every day another Decepticon arrives on the scene. We're outnumbered and outgunned. Yeah, I know what you'd say. Sounds like a fair fight. And if that's the world we live in, so be it. But I just want you to know, I haven't given up. I'm gonna find the con who took you from us. I don't want to hear people bitching ever again about there not being good female characters in media. God, what an amazing performance. And that's how I feel about all of them. Every performance feels raw and real and is just fun to listen to. The dialogue is quite well written, and the voice actors make the most of what they're given, once again completely drawing you into the world. I know I've been really hard on Prime, and I'm sure there's quite a few people who are upset about that. But that's because I love Prime to death, and what better way to challenge myself than criticize my favorite show? As ridiculous as it is to make one's first review as long as this one turned out to be, I felt that that was the only way to properly explain the show, and I still feel like I haven't said enough. I was actually going to add one more segment discussing the themes in Prime, although I decided that would make the video too long and I may make another one at some other point talking about that. Let's take a break from Prime for a second. Firefly, a space western TV show that aired in 2002 with a cast of nine crew members aboard the spaceship Serenity. 
It was well-loved and gained a cult following during its run, and it was well-known for its vibrant storytelling and interesting characters. However, it was cancelled after a singular season, leaving behind a trail of subtle themes and plot lines that, to this day, remain unresolved. A sequel film was created some time later, Serenity, meant to conclude the story for the sake of its many diehard fans. And while it wrapped up the immediate main plot line, it left a lot unfinished, many character arcs and dynamics that would have been fleshed out during the course of several seasons. Both Firefly and Serenity are amazing, and I would absolutely recommend both to anyone who enjoys sci-fi adventures. But without a doubt, it is an unfinished project. It hurts a little, in a way, because when you watch it, you know it was going to be something so amazing, so perfect, if only it had been allowed to continue. But instead, we can only enjoy it for what it is, unable to know for certain its true potential. This is how I feel about Prime. Prime feels exactly like a show that was cancelled too early, that didn't get its full potential. The difference between Prime and Firefly is Prime is technically finished. In Firefly, you can get a piece of foreshadowing and ask what it meant, but know that while you were going to get an answer, this show is cancelled and you can't. Whereas in Prime, you see Arachnid on the moon, know it's supposed to go somewhere, and then see a whole entire show conclude without hearing her get mentioned ever again, on purpose. And that's inexcusable. There is simply no way to walk that back. The times that Prime does this and things like it are the times that Prime is fatally flawed. Curious note, Adam Baldwin and Gina Torres, the voice actors for Breakdown and Arachnid, actually play two characters in Firefly, Jane Cobb and Zoe Washburn. Just a fun fact. Prime, if we think of it as an unfinished show, is absolutely amazing. One of the best shows to exist, period. But as a finished show, it's, uh, it's pretty good. Which is still nice, and it's still my favorite show, but it's only pretty good. I would absolutely recommend it, just watching the characters alone makes it worth it, but I acknowledge that it isn't the best show out there by a long, long shot. I reiterate my point from the plot segment one more time. Transformers Prime was not what the creators wanted it to be, and it's not what we could have had. Whew. Wow. Uh, for those of you who managed to make it this far, thank you for watching. I can't believe I made it to the end. I can't believe you made it to the end, for that matter. Holy cow. This is the first real video I've ever made, so hopefully you all enjoyed this. Before anyone mentions it in the comments, yes, I know. My mic is awful. I'm sorry. It's this crusty 10-year-old USB mic I found lying around because I didn't want to buy an expensive mic for a hobby I wasn't sure I'd actually get into. But if this video does alright, I might make some more, get some real equipment, and this was pretty fun. I'd like to continue to talk about Transformers in general, and not just Prime, but I'm pretty new to the fandom, so let me know if there's anything you guys would like to see in particular. I'm currently working through Cyberverse, so that might be my next project. Anyways, enough rambling. Thanks again for making it to the end with me, and I hope you all have a spectacular day. Till all are one, Zdreicha out.